Hi everyone and welcome to Building Early Literacy Skills with Babies, uh, the first in a series of webinars uh, in a partnership between CLRC, the Central New York Library Resources Council, and the Fayetteville Free Library. Our presenter today is Stephanie Prado, uh, the Director of Play to Learn Services at the Fayetteville Free Library. This is the first of three webinars looking at the subject of literacy and to introduce this subject and the series is Director of the Fayetteville Free Library, Sue Considine. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, everyone. This is Sue, the Executive Director of the Fayetteville Free Library, along with Steph, Stephanie Prado, the FFL Director of Play to Learn Services. The FFL is proud to partner with CLRC to bring this free early literacy webinar series to you, CLRC members. And I understand the ses sessions are open to 3 hours members across New York State. We introduce the series today with Building Early Literacy Skills with Babies. Next, on Thursday, December 10th at 11 o'clock, we'll move on to Engaging Toddlers in Active Early Learning. And finally, on Thursday, January 14th from 11 to 1, we will be offering Infusing Preschool Early Literacy with STEAM, Music, and Movement. So who should attend this, this series? Well, you, of course, but also librarians and staff in public and school libraries, teachers and preschool teachers and other child care providers, and anyone who works with young children and their families. So please pass along this invitation on our behalf to anyone you can think of who might benefit from this content. Steph, get away. All right, thank you. Today we will start with some information about how babies develop, why it's important to start developing their early literacy skills from birth, and what you as librarians and early childhood educators can do to help. Next, we will talk a little bit about collection development and how to choose books for babies of different ages. And finally, we will explore some ideas for activities that you can do with this demographic, including many practical tips for new or enhanced baby programs. So let's get started. We're going to cover first what is early literacy, then we're going to talk a little bit about the different developmental stages that babies go through. Um, we're going to talk about the word gap and why that's important, and an ALSC uh, tool called Babies Need Words Every Day it's a campaign. So what is early literacy? The early childhood years are crucial because the development of language and literacy begins at birth and is a lifelong process. Early literacy is very simply what children know about reading or writing before they can actually read and write. In fact, babies are born with amazingly plastic brains filled with neurons that need connections. In the first few years of life, 700 new neural connections are formed every second. These connections form synapses or pathways that allow for learning and development. These pathways or brain connections are strengthened by repetition. Any connections that are not used are pruned away. We know that the bulk of brain development happens in those first few critical years. Studies have shown that children who do not receive the help they need to develop their brains those first few years of life may always struggle to learn, to read, to form positive relationships, and to be successful in life. Parents play an essential role in this process as their child's first teacher. Librarians and early childhood educators who are privileged to work with these children and their families should support learning and development by modeling behavior in their programs, providing strategies, education, and research to allow parents to do this. And this webinar is designed to help you do exactly that. So how do you do this? Uh, you may be doing many of these things already. You do it when you read books and model how to share them with babies. You do this when you sing and you dance to music, again modeling this behavior. You probably already make books and CDs available for borrowing. You teach songs and rhymes, showing parents step by step how to do these things with their babies. You talk to babies and share with the caregivers the importance of talking at home. And you provide resources for families, including handouts. And again, this webinar is going to um, supplement and add to your toolkit. So now we're going to dive into the developmental stages. 
So before we get into the specifics of programs and collections, I want to discuss what babies can do at some of the different stages of life. And this is important to know as you're planning programs and services. Uh, one simple example would be that we plan most of our baby story times as lap sit programs because we know that most babies will not walk until 10 to 12 months old. So starting with our youngest, zero to three months, um, who believe it or not, there are already many things they can do. For example, at zero to three months old, babies can already recognize familiar voices and smells, like those of parents and relatives, and they respond to smiles and touches. In baby programs, include action rhymes in which parents lay the baby on the floor and walk their fingers up baby's body or help baby kick his legs and wave his arms to aid in this kind of development. Babies need this kind of stimulation. Babies can see fairly well at birth as long as the item is close up, 12 to 18 inches away ideally. This is important to know because if you are reading to a young group of babies from two feet away, they won't be able to see or focus on the book. With this age group, it is smart to include lots of lap activities for caregivers to do with babies. Encourage them to let baby try to hold shakers or props or other toys during the program since they are already developing the ability to grip and hold things. By three to six months, babies are starting to gain more control over their bodies. They can sit up with help and hold their heads steady. At this age, encourage parents to place their babies in different positions to help her develop new skills like rolling, creeping, and crawling. Make sure she gets time to play on her back and her stomach and incorporate opportunities for both positions in your programs when possible. Babies at this age are incredibly responsive. They can wave their arms, kick their legs, babble, and coo. In the next couple of months, they start recognizing their names and respond when it is called, which is often why we sing or clap hello to welcome each child individually. Babies will also begin to repeat the sounds that they hear. At this very young age, baby is still mostly focused on the caregiver and responds enthusiastically to this kind of interaction. Great activities to do at this age include singing and action rhymes performed for the baby by the caregiver or nursery rhymes with puppets. Having moms or dads dance around with baby can also be a lot of fun. Be sure not to use loud noises or sound during this phase of baby's life as many will still startle and cry. So uh, by six to nine months, babies are learning how to think and solve problems. Around six months, they begin to sit up, crawl, and become conscious of other babies in the room. During the next six months, babies will begin to resist the floor play that worked so wonderfully in those first few months. Babies do better at this age with bouncing rhymes and action rhymes that involve clapping, waving hello, and interacting with music by shaking shakers or scarves. Peekaboo will be a big hit at this age, but babies still think that when something is out of sight, it completely it is gone. If you have parents sharing books individually with their babies, be prepared for the struggles that might ensue when baby tries to grab the book and turn the pages. Babies at this age are curious and eat everything and grab everything. Make sure everything you hand to caregiver and baby is clean and safe for them to put in baby's mouth. At this age, some babies will also start to develop stranger anxiety, so understand that a child who loved you might start to act a little bit more reserved and respect that. By 9 to 12 months old, babies can understand more words than they can say. All that reading and talking you've been doing is already having an impact. Encourage parents to put baby's sounds, actions, and feelings into words. For example, you are pushing your food away. I think that you're telling me you're all done. You can also try naming things that the baby looks or points to. That's the moon. The moon comes out at night, etc. Babies at this stage also love to do things over and over again. This is how they practice and figure out how things work. As we mentioned previously, repetition also helps build their memories. They are beginning to become mobile and be may begin wandering around the room looking everywhere but at you. Helpful caregivers can assist with refocusing babies by pointing and saying, look. It also helps to use interactive lift the flat books, props, or books and objects that make sounds. Babies at this age are also learning that things still exist even when they disappear. 
So games of peekaboo and lift the flat books build on this understanding of the permanence of things. I'm going to stop here at 12 months, but the 12 to 24 month age range and developmental stages will be discussed in the next webinar in this series. So we just learned that by nine months, babies already understand more words than they can say. But did you know that by 18 months, disparities in vocabulary begin to appear? The term word gap was first coined in 1995 by, Hart, by a Hart and Risley study that found that low income children are exposed to 30 million fewer words than their higher income peers before age three. This study and others have linked poor early literacy skills in the years before preschool to lifelong academic, social, and income disparities. That's right. These disparities begin before children even enter preschool, let alone kindergarten. This problem is gaining increased recognition and is being addressed through a number of programs and initiatives, among them President Obama's Early Learning Initiative and Push for Universal Preschool, and our own New York State Initiative, Ready to Read at New York Libraries. Teachers, librarians, and other early childhood educators play a huge and important role in this effort, but we can't close the gap alone. I might, for example, have one interaction with a family per week for a maximum of 30 minutes. Parents, on the other hand, spend hours with their children and can have an enormous impact on their development, which is why family literacy education and modeling are so important. Librarians can give parents the tools and strategies they need to build early literacy skills at home. Research has found that the best way to close the word gap is by providing a language-rich environment for children. Reading is one way, but there are many other ways as well, such as talking, singing, and playing. There are a number of studies that show that when children hear a good deal of live language, i.e. when they are spoken to often and encouraged to communicate, they are more proficient with language than children who have more limited language exposure. Note only live language, not television, produced produce these vocabulary boosting effects. As this infographic illustrates, words are just the tip of the iceberg. Here are some other things you can do, and you can encourage families to do, to enrich the way we communicate with our babies. So let's start with interesting activities. Museums, zoos, and yes, libraries, make for wonderfully enriching experiences for children. But remind parents that everyday trips and activities like grocery shopping are just as important as they offer the opportunity to teach children new things about the world. The next one is books. Children should be surrounded with reading material because in books we encounter words and ideas that we don't use every day. Similarly, through story times, we remind families to read aloud. When children are read to, they become familiar with the special way that language is used in books. They learn new words, expand their knowledge, and build relationships with the adults who are reading to them. We incorporate songs and rhymes into every story time because we know they teach children to recognize the smaller sounds within words, which prepares them to read later in life. Don't be afraid to use new and big words. Model how to discuss word meanings and how those words relate to things the child already knows. Talk to children and encourage them to talk back. Listen to them and try to understand what they are saying. Ask questions and check what they understand. You can do this even before children are speaking. So with babies, when they start to coo and respond to you, have a, quote, conversation with them and make noises and sounds back. Um, the next one is big ideas. While some advanced concepts might not be developmentally appropriate for very young children, children are naturally curious and eager to learn. Try exposing them to some important topics in a friendly way and have a conversation about it. Finally, let parents know that storytelling is another great way to build language and to pass on family history and traditions. There are so many ways to build language with babies. What matters most is that children learn best from personal interactions with family and caregivers. Remind parents often that they are the best teacher there is. If you're looking for additional tools to help share information about closing the word gap with families, 
ALSC has you covered. The ALA Association of Library Services to Children just launched a new campaign called Babies Need Words Every Day. Talk, read, sing, play. This is a project I am pleased to have worked on directly as a member of the ALSC Early Childhood Programs and Services Committee. Babies Need Words Every Day resources include eight visually appealing posters that deliver simple, effective rhymes, games, and other suggestions for immediate enriching ways to communicate with babies, similar to those we have just discussed. These shareable resources were designed to bridge the 30 million word gap by providing parents with proven ways to build their children's early literacy skills. The eight free posters with artwork from acclaimed children's author Il Sung Na are available in English and Spanish. They are designed for use as an outreach and education tool and are ideal for posting above changing tables in child care centers, in doctor's waiting rooms, and anywhere else where children and their caregivers might have a moment to talk, read, sing, and play. ALSC also provides a book list that suggests some high quality and developmentally appropriate board books for parents to request at their local library. We encourage you to download, display, spread, and share these free printable resources as widely as possible. I know that was a lot of information, but thanks for hanging in there with me. You will see in the next two sections how the developmental stages and the research we just talked about really informs our best practices for collections and programs. Here we are segueing from research and tools to collection development tips. In this section, I will explain how the Fayetteville Free Library reconsidered how families discover and access traditional collections like board books and how we developed non-traditional items like born to read kits. But first, some quick advice for choosing books for babies. You will notice that the age ranges overlap here. As with, some reader, as with all readers' advisory, sometimes preferences are determined more by personality of the baby than by their age. But in general, for babies zero to six months, remember that very young babies of this age have weaker vision, so choose books that have simple large pictures or designs with bright or high contrasting colors. Choose stiff cardboard or chunky books that can't be easily torn or destroyed when chewed on. And consider fold-out books that can be fun as they are able to be propped up on a floor or in a crib. For babies 6 to 12 months, choose board books with photos of other babies because at this age they are fascinated by other babies' faces. Again, look for brightly colored chunky board books which babies will delight in touching and tasting. Also think about selecting books with simple pictures of familiar objects that babies might recognize in their daily lives. For young toddlers, 9 to 24 months old, choose, again, sturdy books that they can carry but can't rip, books with photos of children doing familiar things like sleeping or playing, and start to think about goodnight books for bedtime, which are important because at this age, children start to notice daily routines as early as six to nine months. Look for books with only a few words on each page that have brightly colored, engaging illustrations. I also like to purchase books with simple rhymes or predictable text, touch and feel books, and animal books of all shapes and sizes. When providing reader's advisory to young children, don't shy away from including them in the process in addition to your discussion with their parents. For example, try holding up two choices and notice which book baby looks at longer or reaches for. I think I already mentioned that ALSC has a great book list for you to check out or to print and use as a handout to parents. For example, uh, we print this out in the summer and use it as our summer um, baby summer reading list in case parents are looking for recommendations. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about the books we use for baby story time and how those differ, if at all, from the collection development piece we just talked about. I do use board books in baby story time because they are developmentally appropriate. Our baby groups tend to be smaller and more intimate, 10 babies maximum, so I don't need to worry too much about large crowds where children might not be able to see the book. However, this may be a consideration for some. Favorite authors include Karen Katz, Sandra Boynton, Leslie Patricelli, 
And of course, there are many, many more great ones. I'm sure you already have your own favorites. I do use themes in baby story time, but I keep them to basic concepts like animals, daily life, colors, shapes, or bedtime. Some themes that I would do in a preschool story time might work less well for babies. And these include things like celebrations, like Halloween or birthdays, or abstract concepts like manners or friendship. Try using books with sounds you can make. Uh, animal sounds are very popular, or transportation sounds like chug chug, toot toot. Um, babies love these, and again, they start to mimic sounds fairly early, so you might hear them trying to imitate the sounds that you're making. You should also consider including a book that you can sing. Singing helps babies focus and is an early literacy skill itself, so this is always a great option. Many familiar nursery songs like Ba Ba Black Sheep or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star come in board book form and can be sung. I will often choose a title like this for the end of baby story time as it helps to recapture waning attention. Don't forget, you can also use picture books. Some picture books are simple enough to use with babies. Um, Baron Barton or Eric Carle's books are good examples. Um, stick to the rule of relatively few words per page and per page and focus on things like colors or animals or again nothing too too abstract. So the next slide we're going to talk about tips for reading with babies. So these are tips that I offer to you um, but these are also things that I say to parents all the time so feel free to recycle them and, and use them um, in your own toolkit when you're talking to parents and trying to help them read with a baby who might not be interested in, in sitting at the, that moment in time. Um, so first and foremost, we do understand that young children can only sit for a few minutes for a story. As they grow, they will be able to sit longer, but you cannot reasonably expect a baby or toddler to sit for 30 minutes. And I always make sure to let parents know that we understand this. Tell them that a few minutes at a time is okay, and not to worry if they don't finish the story. As the story time facilitator, you will want to finish the book most of the time, but make sure to let parents know it's okay if baby's attention wanders. I encourage parents to bring the child back to the group activity when and if they can, but I'd much rather have a child who has fun and positive associations with reading and the library than one who is resisting and forced to pay attention. This advice can apply to you too. As the storyteller, I have also given up on a book partway through and switched activities if a group really isn't with me. Just smile and say, okay, enough of that, let's sing a song. Don't worry, you can always go back to the book later in the program. Again, while you don't necessarily have as much flexibility in a program setting with multiple children, encourage parents to let their children decide how much or how little time they spend reading at home. Parents don't need to read every page. They may find that their child has a favorite page or even a favorite picture. He may want to linger there for a while and then switch books or activities. Babies may also just want to mouth the book. That's okay. When you let a child explore books in a way that interests him, the reading experience will be more meaningful. Another strategy is to talk or sing about the pictures. Um, you probably know that you don't have to read the words to tell a story. This is especially true of board books that might only have one word per page. Try reading the pictures in a book sometimes and model how to do this for parents. Instead of just reading the word apple, try something like this. This apple is red and this apple is green. There are two apples on this page. Apples are delicious to eat. You may not have eaten an apple yet, but you might enjoy apple juice, which is tart and sweet. Look at how many words and how much context you just added. You can also try letting children turn the pages. Uh, babies cannot yet turn pages on their own, but an 18 month old will wanna give it a try and a three year old can certainly do it alone. This can also be a great strategy for dealing with babies and toddlers who might wanna take the book away from you when you're reading to the group. Instead, hold on to the book and encourage them to help you turn the page. Make the story interactive when possible. If the story mentions a body part, encourage babies to touch their heads as you read the word. Is there a book or a bird in the book that's flying? Encourage babies and parents to flap their arms. 
make it personal. Uh, so as you as you read about pets, um, talk about your own family's pets or the community when you're reading about others in a story. And finally, ask questions about the story and let children ask questions too. This is sometimes called dialogic reading, and it allows you to have a back and forth conversation with the child. Again, you can do this with babies even when they aren't talking back yet by talking about the familiar activities and objects that you see in the illustrations and read about in the story. You should also encourage parents to make books a part of their daily routine. Remind them that the more books are woven into their child's everyday lives, the more likely they will be to see reading as a pleasure and a gift. So now that you know what kinds of books to select and how to best encourage babies and families to read them, how do you create access to the books themselves? We have a nice site. collections access and browsability. Instead of shelving these books by author or no order at all, we chose to categorize each board book title by topic. The 18 resulting categories are listed here. The units themselves that store the board books are low to the ground and easy to browse. As you can see in the picture, um, each book has a colorful stem in the front that matches the label on the unit, which also makes reshelving and shelf reading this highly circulating an often disheveled collection much easier. Board books are subject to heavy wear and tear, and they do need to be replaced, but they are relatively expensive, and we have budgeted for this with uh, this in mind. In addition to our board book collection, we also provide access to resources for babies called the FFL Born to Read Kit. And this is something that we um, designed and developed and produced right here at the Fayetteville Free Library. Each kit has a theme, like seasons or transportation, and each kit contains three board books, one children's music CD, and a toy all relating to that topic. The kit also features a unique laminated insert that suggests extension activities and tips for reading with babies, encouraging parents to talk, sing, read, and play with their children, while explaining to parents why these practices are vital to their baby's development. These kits are often referred to as story time in a bag and are favorites among working parents who may not have the time to attend traditional programming. So now that we've covered uh, collections, uh, we're going to talk about some of the specific programs that we offer for babies at the Fayetteville Free Library. So the first one is called Cuddle Time. Cuddle Time is our baby story time, and it's a lap sit program designed for babies who are not yet walking. Generally, this is zero to 12 months, um, but we tend to phrase it as that, that developmental stage, not yet walking or not walking well, as opposed to um, a specific hard age. Um, during this program, we, saw, we sing, talk, say rhymes, read books, and play, incorporating all of the major ways of building language. Also include, we also include tips for parents and explain what we are doing and why we are doing things to teach families about the importance of early literacy in each session. We start the program off by singing and waving hello to each child. Then we use some familiar rhymes that parents might already know, in addition to introducing new ones. There are, um, there are many different types of rhymes, and I thought we could uh, cover some here. So the first one we mentioned previously are bouncing rhymes. So an example would be, uh, bounce this baby on my knee, ride this horse to Tennessee, ride it fast, ride it slow, ride it to the rodeo, and you're bouncing the baby to the rhythm of the rhyme. Another type of rhyme is called a finger play. So examples of finger plays include the itsy bitsy spider, where you walk your fingers up like the spider, or twinkle twinkle little star. And finger plays are wonderful. Um, at this age, it's an interaction between the baby and the caregiver while the baby is watching the caregiver. But as babies grow older, um, finger plays help them develop their fine motor skills as they begin to do those things with their fingers themselves. There are also full body rhymes, so patty cake, uh, the standard patty cake is an example of that. 
So patty cake, patty cake, baker's man, you're clapping your hands to the beat. Bake me a cake as fast as you can. You pat it, so you're touching the baby's hands, and you're, you prick it, so you can prick a baby's palm or their back and mark it with a B, so you're drawing the letter B, and put it in the oven for baby and me. So you're pushing baby's hands forward, and so it's kind of a whole body experience for the baby and the caregiver. There are also tickle rhymes, so an example of that would be crisscross applesauce or pizza pickle pumpernickel. My little baby shall have a tickle. Um, you know, in crisscross applesauce, you draw an X on the baby's back and big squeeze, you give them a hug and cool breeze, and now you have the shivers and you tickle. Um, body awareness rhymes are also important because you're you're teaching body parts at the same time that you're doing the rhyme. So for example, I touch my nose, I touch my toes, or you could sing, this is the way we wash our face, or even if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands is a great example of body awareness rhymes that you could use. If you don't know these rhymes, don't worry. A simple Google search turns up tons of them that different libraries have put together. And I can also send along to anyone who's interested the main list of rhymes that we use at the Fayetteville Free Library. Repetition is good, remember, so try picking six or seven rhymes and repeating them for a few months to give caregivers and babies the chance to really learn them. Singing helps to refocus babies, so it's good to throw in a rhyme that's a song when you're losing their attention or right before a book. For example, I always use Twinkle Twinkle Little Star as a calming song and I sing it very softly and slowly to try to get the babies and the parents sometimes to refocus. During cuddle time, I usually read two board books and I use one read along or focus book where each child and caregiver gets a copy of the book to look at. I generally purchase 12 copies of each focus book and I like to use titles that are on basic concepts. So a couple of good examples include Donald Cruz uh, Freight Train because that's a great one for color themes and transportation themes. Um, I also like to use touch and feel books because they, uh, touch and feel books don't work otherwise in a group setting, but when each child has a copy, uh, they're much more effective. So um, other topics include seasons and animals, body parts, um, Eric Carl's From Head to Toe is one that we use a lot in baby story time. And um, they're a really great way for each child to get the opportunity in cuddle time to hold and read a book one-on-one -on -one with their parent or caregiver. So towards the end of cuddle time, we always do an activity, and we'll talk some more about things you can do on the next slide. Then we sing our goodbye song, and finally, we have free playtime. Free playtime is essential. We all know that babies are demanding, and having that free time at the end of the program gives parents some time to socialize. This time allows parents to meet one another and find support and advice in a friendly, casual environment. I've heard them ask questions about teething, potty training, and talk about other opportunities for babies that exist in the community. So don't skimp on free playtime if at all possible. So now I want to talk a little bit about enhancing your baby's story time. And these are things that you can do during that sort of activity portion or you can add to a program that you might already have to just kick it up a notch. Uh, so the first one is to incorporate baby signs. Using some signing vocabulary is a great way to enhance your baby's story time. As we've mentioned, babies are communicating long before they are able to verbalize. So including some simple signs like all done, hungry, more, thank you, things that babies and their parents would use in everyday life could be really useful. And you as the facilitator would only need to learn a handful and then repeat them over and over again because repetition is key. The next ones are shakers and scarves. So these are fun additions to any baby story time that help incorporate a play element. You can have babies and caregivers practice concepts like shaking fast or slow, high or low. 
You can use scarves to highlight body parts. For example, in the song, this is the way we wash our, our face, our arms, our legs, and touch each body part with a scarf as you sing it. Um, this leads right into music. Obviously, we always sing in baby story time, but it can also be fun to include pre-recorded music. Don't be afraid of using classical music, too. You can put classical music on in the background during free play periods and use it as a way to incorporate some new music and new tastes into your story time. In the summertime, bubbles are a fun and relatively inexpensive item that you can include in your programs. There are different things you can do with bubbles. You can just play with them, or sometimes you can. You, I'll sing a song, um, like one little, two little, three little bubbles to the tune of one little, two little, three little Indians, and you can end with pop, 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 pop. Um, or again, they the babies will just um, track it with their eyes sometimes, and they're able to to follow the bubble, and you know that's an important skill as well. The next one on the list are mirrors. So with mirrors, safety first, make sure you pick plastic mirrors with no sharp edges. But this is wonderful because babies love to look at themselves. So you can use a mirror to make faces at the baby and practice recognizing emotions like happy or sad. Um, you can hold it up to their faces and then point out their features like their eyes, their nose, and their ears. Uh, many, many of you probably already use puppets or plush toys, plush animals for storytelling. Um, or you can just have the babies pat and look at them at the beginning or ending of a program. Again, be prepared for some grabbing and be as graceful as possible about preventing puppet snatching. It does happen. Um, the next one on the list are uh, balls. So consider purchasing, for example, inflatable beach balls to use in your baby program. They're expensive, they're inexpensive, they're colorful, they're lightweight, and easy to clean up and store because they just deflate and fit almost anywhere. And you can use them, you can push them around the room so the caregivers can help roll them across the circle um, and babies watch and sometimes grab. I've also seen babies just hold on to them and kind of drool on them, but they're exciting and um, the rolling and pushing is another fun skill for them to practice. It can be chaotic, but always very fun. So this leads us right into music and movement, which is an early childhood music class. We have offered this program for ages zero to six, which is a very wide age range, um, but it's an especially great way to add to your programming opportunities for your youngest patrons. If you already have a baby story time and you're thinking about uh, supplementing or you really want to add to that schedule for the um, younger age group, a music and movement program is ideal. Since babies are musical beings even before birth, it's never too early to get started. Even newborns are amazingly oriented to become music makers. Because they begin to hear and respond to sound in the womb, most babies' sense of hearing is well developed at birth and they are already alert to musical sounds, especially the voice of a parent singing. Studies show that babies perceive differences in loudness and melody, respond to tempo changes, and sense when a song is ending. They often move physically when music starts or stops and may show a startle response when the music ends even in their sleep. In case you need some more reasons why you should consider having a baby music and movement program, we know that music is vital to the development of language and listening skills. Music engages the brain, stimulating neural pathways that are associated with higher forms of intelligence, such as empathy and mathematics. And music's melody and rhythmic patterns help develop memory. For example, who among us learned their letters without singing the ABC song? In Music and Movement, we sing and we use the library's collection of music, children's music CDs. Favorite artists include The Wiggles, Jim Gill, Lori Berkner Band, and Raffi. We also use instruments like maracas, tambourines, bells, drums, and rhythm sticks. Props include scarves, balls, and a parachute. 
You now know that even babies as young as three months old can hold and manipulate objects like shakers and bells, which is why we incorporate these. And many of the songs that you already use in baby story time can be adapted to a music and movement setting. For example, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, or head, shoulders, knees, and toes, even row, row, row your boat, you could have them bounce along. Um, and Old MacDonald with a flannel board. Uh, these are all wonderful songs that you already know and use that you can rebrand into a music and movement program. We have had great success and a wonderful response from the community with this program, which is why we wanted to share it with you. Programs like Let's Learn are a great way to create an enriching play space for babies. If you're, if you're lucky, you might already have a permanent play space for babies in your children's room with books, activity cubes, and other manipulatives in addition to board books that are available to families all the time. We are fortunate to have a space like this in our children's room, but we also work to create temporary and theme-based play programs. For example, over the summer, we offered three sessions of Let's Learn, a drop-in play program that created a play environment for babies and their caregivers to explore colors, shapes, and textures were the three topics. Uh, in the picture here, you see some of the items we used in the colors session. I did start the program off by singing hello and sharing one story and a few rhymes, but the majority of Let's Learn was self-guided. Creating an enriching space like this one allows babies the autonomy to explore and learn at their own pace. This program series was held in our multi-purpose community room for 30 to 45 minutes. Some of the things we did included um, a flannel board of brown bear. So brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a blue horse, purple cat, etc. Um, I had colored water bottles for them to play with and look at. Uh, colored sorting bags for them to practice sorting. Uh, you can see some pretend food in color coordinating bins, so they had to sort all the yellow foods into the yellow bin, and uh, books on colors, soft, soft colored dice, and some colored Duplo blocks to build with. This is a more informal type of program, so it gives additional time for parent interaction and for that type of community building that we were talking about that happens in the free play session of cuddle time. It's also a great opportunity for you, again, as the facilitator and the, and the expert, to model how to talk with babies and teach them. So, you know, if, for example, a baby picks up a red pretend apple, again, you can talk about that food and how it's edible and what color it is and uh, help them to put words to the things that they are seeing and experiencing. So last but not least, I wanted to talk about siblings and our policy here at the FFL about siblings. So while we work hard to create developmentally appropriate programs for specific age groups, we know that siblings are a fact of life. It isn't always possible or realistic to expect that parents will be able to find alternative activities or child care for older children so they can attend a baby program. At the FFL, we try to be as welcoming as possible to families. Bringing an older brother or sister might make the difference between whether or not a family visits the library. It is more important to us that a family feels comfortable and welcome at the library than that a program is 100% developmentally appropriate for all participants. Plus, even if you restrict your program to a narrow age range and disallow siblings, Participants will still represent different stages of physical, cognitive, and emotional development. Welcoming older siblings supports the development of babies and toddlers by supporting the family as a whole. Being inclusive of siblings has other benefits too. For example, they make great role models. Older siblings can help out by passing out shakers or modeling the rhymes. You can involve these children whenever possible. Um, for example, if an older sibling shows up to a baby story time, consider offering him or her a puppet to use as their, quote, baby to do the bounces with, or you can also encourage them to bounce themselves, which I often do. 
Finally, by welcoming older siblings into story time, we open a space up for discussion of the practicalities that parents deal with every day. How do you select a story that will appeal to a baby and a toddler? How do you read to both at the same time? We can offer resources and strategies for incorporating early literacy into the real lives of families, and welcoming siblings is a prime way to do that. So that is the end of the um, formal part of the presentation. I have some of the, all of the references and resources that I included throughout the presentation here for your reference. And I wanted to say thank you. Um, here is the contact information for uh, Sue Constantine, our executive director, who introduced the webinar series at the beginning, and the link to our website and some additional information. And thank you to Stephanie and all of the team at Fayetteville Free Library for putting together this great presentation. Uh, if you have requests for additional professional development content, you can always uh, reach us at clrc.org. And we're happy to, to put on whatever we can to help you uh, better serve your patrons in your community. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinars in this series. Thanks so much.